Hello, my name is Jason Hunt, and I'd like to welcome you to this session called Lead From Where You Stand, How You Can Influence as a Middle-Level Leader. I'm super excited to be here and to be to share with you this particular message about how middle-level leaders can have great impact on both that they, those that they lead and those that they serve. I want to start first off with kind of explaining a story about a bunch of cannibals. These cannibals had gone out and gotten a job and the HR director did all this wonderful training and helping incorporate them into the new organization of onboarding them, training them and teaching them. And at the very end, she said, here's the deal. We don't want you to eat our people. You see, we've stocked lots of food into our lounge, and so anytime that you're hungry, just go over to the lounge and get all the food that you want, and that way you won't be eating our people. Well, the cannibal seemed pretty satisfied with that, so they nodded their heads up and down in agreement, and the HR director left off to her work. Several weeks go by, and it seems like things are going very, very well. And then suddenly one day, the, secret the HR director comes back to these cannibals, and she asks the question, Hey, um... Do any of you know what happened to our secretary? And the cannibals looked at each other and, and then responded to, this, to the HR director that, no, they, they don't know what happened to the secretary. Well, as soon as the HR director walked off, one of the leaders of the cannibals turned to the rest of them and said, hey, which one of you idiots ate the secretary? And sheepishly, some guy in the back kind of raised his hand and he said this. He said, you crazy guy. We've been eating middle-level leaders all day long and nobody's ever noticed, but now you had to go and eat somebody important. <laughs> Folks, I share that story because sometimes as a middle-level leader, we can feel like we're not somebody important. Sometimes we can feel like we're stuck in the middle. And I want to be able to share with you some of the challenges that I've found as I've worked with middle-level leaders that really get people stuck. That's right. Middle-level leadership can be difficult. And so what I'd like to share with you to start off with are five challenges that I've found through my own research that middle-level leaders often find themselves in. The first challenge is this thing called the translator challenge. The fact that you can't please everybody all the time. This means that your senior leader might come up with an idea, a thought, or a program and present it to you and your job is to carry that out through your people. Therefore, you translate what your senior leader is asking you to do into actionable items for each of your staff members on the front line. It's not always an easy job because sometimes there's not much clarity. Sometimes the people you're leading don't want to do it. And so you find yourself stuck in between these two different places trying to be a translator. Another challenge that I've often found is this idea of a sequence challenge. This challenge means that your work depends upon other departments. That is, you by yourself or even your department can't get everything done because you're part of a sequence of what occurs. Something has to happen here, and then it's your turn, and then something over here. And so you're part of the process. Therefore, your pressure that you might feel from other departments can be high, or you might have a great degree of angst or maybe even frustration when other departments aren't doing their job as quickly as you would need them to do to get your job done. A third challenge that I find is this idea of influencing up. Maybe you're being led by a leader that you think could be a little bit better of a leader. Or maybe you've got some ideas or your frontline staff have come to you and they have shared some ideas that need to be implemented, but your challenge is your boss isn't on board. And so now you've got to influence your boss. That sometimes can be a very difficult thing to do. That's the third challenge. A fourth challenge that I find is this idea of authority. This means that the buck doesn't stop with you. That is, if you've got a direct report that's completely upset at you, let's say a programmer isn't approving of your way of leading or doesn't agree with one of the decisions that you've made, they can certainly go to you, but if that doesn't work out, they go around you and go up to somebody more senior. That can be difficult because sometimes a senior leader might make a decision contrary to your thoughts or your previous decision, therefore putting yourself in quite a pickle. But that's part of the challenge of middle level leadership. The fifth challenge that I've found that middle level, middle level leaders face is this idea of reality. That is the reality that you're still working. You're still doing a lot of the practical day-to-day -day work that happens in any of your organizations. So maybe you are still programming. Maybe you are still coordinating different events. Maybe you're still working in some of the data pieces and not leading all of the time. 
That's totally normal for middle-level leaders. They often find themselves in a position where they have to lead, but they have to get work done too at the same time. So that's the fifth challenge of being a middle-level leader. You can imagine with all these challenges, this makes this job very hard. In fact, if you look at the research, you're gonna recognize a few really powerful things. Number one, the average middle-level leader has 50% more direct reports right now than they did 10 years ago. If that's you, go ahead and put it in the chat, yes, that's me, all right? I come across middle-level leaders frequently that have doubled the size of the teams that are leading simply because of a staffing issue that we're facing right now, or maybe it's a budgetary concern, and so therefore they end up leading more and more people, which does make this job difficult. Furthermore, middle-level leaders have the highest rates of anxiety and depression than any other worker group. This is according to the Columbia University of Public Health who did a massive study and they realize that a lot of middle-level leaders are just getting burnt out. There's another research study too that says that middle-level leaders report more stress and burnout, work, worse work-life balance, worse physical well-being than those that they lead. This is a tough job, ladies and gentlemen, it really is. Finally, they fall in the bottom 5% of job satisfaction. Now, if you feel like giving up and exiting out of this particular breakout session because, oh my gosh, I've overwhelmed you with all the challenges of being a middle-level leader, have hope, have hope. I only share that to relate to you that you're actually feeling the same things that a lot of other middle-level middle level leaders are feeling. These are common experiences a lot of people go through. And my specialty, what I focus my business on, where I spend the majority of my time, is helping people just like you, middle-level leaders, supervisors or managers, trying to navigate these difficult and sometimes challenging or frustrating waters so they can be successful, so they can bring uh, the paycheck home and have joy and happiness while doing it. That's my job and that's what I hope to do with you today in this session called Leading From Where You Stand. What I'd like to do is share with you three different ideas about how you can make your job for the leader, senior leader easier and then three additional ideas about how you can be able to help your direct reports. As I do so, it's important for us to kind of think about this in a framework. You may have heard that sometimes being a middle-level leader is like being stuck in between a rock and a hard place. And that's certainly true, but follow with me a little bit on this analogy. Imagine the rock is actually the burden that your senior leader carries. You see, senior leaders oftentimes are weighed down by numbers and P&L charts, and basically they have to get stuff done, right? It's all, it's all a matter of the end bottom line for them. And this can be a very heavy duty, a heavy responsibility for them to have on their shoulders. Contrary to that, we have our direct reports. And oftentimes our direct reports might feel trapped behind a wall, trapped because they want to do more or they uh, don't have the skill set to do more. Maybe we haven't delegated or empowered them enough. And so we truly do as middle-level leaders find ourselves stuck between a rock and this wall or what I call a hard place. So what can we do about this? How can we be able to alleviate this problem? Well, one is we can help lighten the load of our leaders. That's a really critical component we can take a look at. And two is we can free, that is we can break down the wall that stands between us and our direct reports and help empower them and delegate them and help them become more able to do their own jobs and perhaps even be cross-trained to other jobs too. So this is kind of the framework, the idea, the analogy I'm going to use as I go through this particular session today. Let's start with your senior leaders. Let's start with talking about how we can lighten their load. The first tool, the first idea that we have on how to lighten their load is just simply not adding more weight. <laughs> I know sometimes that sounds a little bit silly, but uh, there are too many times for me to be comfortable with when I'm working with a middle level leader and they're actually adding more weight onto their senior leader. That obviously is not a good idea. Your senior leader has a lot of weight already on his or her shoulders and your job is to actually make it easier, make it lighter, not make it heavier. So, First and foremost, as a good, high-quality, middle-level leader, what do we need to do? Focus on being a good self-leader. I've got a whole entire session, in fact, a series of sessions that deal with self-leadership. But for now, let me just give you a little bit of a highlight of what I mean. When I talk about leading yourself well, I'm talking about managing your emotions, making sure that you are in check, that you don't get so upset that it's actually causing problems for your senior leader, 
But then you also come to work with some pizzazz, some energy, some passion about the work that you're doing. I also ask you that you should be managing your energy levels. That is not being worn out every single day, taking care of yourself and your body. It might mean getting more sleep. It might mean actually cutting work off when the end of the day ends and you actually just go enjoy some personal time. I don't know what it specifically means in your world. But what I do ask of you is to pay attention to the energy that you have. Make sure that you're showing to work each and every day with the best amount of energy that you possibly can. That's good for you. It's also good for your senior leader. I also ask that you manage your time. Time management is really critical. In fact, it's kind of a uh, just a requirement for being in leadership. If we're not good with time management, I don't know if being a leader is a good fit for you. So what do we need to do? Get better at managing our time. Really critical for us to be able to do this, and I think it's a powerful piece that we can use to help our senior leaders. I also ask that you manage your thinking. Um, too often, I think, in our societies, we tend to focus on the negative. It's really easy to talk about the bad things that are happening or the storm that is coming. That's convenient, but it's not very productive, and it's certainly not helpful. So as a middle-level leaders, as, as a middle-level leader, I encourage you to strive each and every day to be as positive and optimistic as possible while still recognizing there's reality. You can't overlook the problems, but certainly look at these problems as challenges that you can, with your team and a little bit of work, overcome. And finally, I ask that you manage your personal life. Don't do anything stupid that you might find yourself in the newspapers with. That's obviously not good for you, your senior leader, or the organization that you're working with. You want to be able to manage your personal life in a good way so that you're not bringing in baggage into work, so that you're actually showing up to work each and every day ready to contribute to your very fullest degree. So these are five different ways that I kind of encourage you to make sure that you're not adding weight to your senior leaders. It's the first step we can take to making sure that we're helping lift our leader's load. Step number two. Step number two is honoring your leader's time. Honoring your leader's time. When I talk about honoring your leader's time, there's kind of two things that I'm really talking about here. The first thing is in communication. So we wanna make sure that we have very crystal clear communication with our senior leaders. The second step is in our problems, making sure that when we bring problems to our senior leaders, we're actually presenting solutions along with those problems. Let me describe each one of these just for a little bit. Um, several years ago, I was working as a uh, principal in a school. So I was leading a school of 800 students. And on our staff, we had one teacher who we had suspicions of that maybe she had a problem with alcohol. Maybe she was an alcoholic. And so we kind of watched carefully and gathered some data and kind of tried to find the evidence that we could to have a confrontation with her. Well, one day we felt like we had enough evidence. And so we called up our superintendent and I said, hey, superintendent, we'd like to have a sit down intervention meeting with this particular staff member. We believe that she's probably an alcoholic and maybe even drunk on the job today. Well, our superintendent was extremely upset, but not so much at our staff member. Obviously, he was disappointed with her, but more about me. He was upset at me. Why? Because I had not communicated this, him, to the, this to him earlier. He was taken by surprise that we had done all this work and all this research gathering before we actually communicated anything to him. So we had a clash of communication because he wanted more and I didn't give enough. Ladies and gentlemen, I think it's imperative for us to be able to have conversations with our senior leaders about communication. In fact, I call it a communication charter. It's basically a sit-down meeting, and it doesn't have to take very long, maybe just 30 minutes, where you and your senior leader specifically talk about communication. Nothing else, just simply how and when we're going to communicate together. One of those ways you can do that is to walk through a series of questions similar to these questions right here. Now, I know that's a lot of writing on one slide. We're probably not supposed to do that. But I wanted to give you some ideas about what you could talk about if you sat down with your senior leader and had a communication charter meeting. Uh, for example, you could ask him or her how frequently they would like communication. You could ask them how quickly you should expect a reply from them. 
Or maybe, you know, are they interested in small talk or do they just want to get down to business? That's a good thing for us to be able to discuss. Perhaps like number nine, I love number nine, you know, what's the best way you can actually highlight the good work that you're doing? One of the problems with middle level leaders is we don't take credit for the good stuff that's happening and we don't get recognized oftentimes for the good stuff that's happening. So it's up to you to kind of bring that up to your senior leader. Let them know what wonderful things you're doing and having a communication charter meeting can give you the opportunity to discuss how to make that happen. So I encourage you in this second step, this second tool of honoring your leader's time to take a moment and think about if you could have a communication charter meeting with your senior leader. The other thing that I talk about when we speak of honoring your leader's time is problems. You see, problems that happen all the time. Uh, I imagine even today, uh, as you, before you jumped onto these, uh, this conference and started listening to these breakout sessions, I'm going to guess you probably were dealing with some problems. Problems are great because they're job security. If we didn't have any problems at all, most likely a lot of you wouldn't even have jobs anymore, right? Aren't you just trying to solve a problem? Here's the deal, though. If you are constantly bringing problems to your senior leader without any kind of solutions, you're adding more weight. You're making their jobs more difficult. Your job, your responsibility, I believe a primary role of middle level leaders is actually to identify problems and then create solutions that you can bring to your senior leader. That is, every time you go to your senior leader, you should say something like, hey, Bob or Sally or Joe or Muhammad or whatever, here's a problem we're facing on our team. We've brainstormed. We've come up with a couple of different solutions. Here's a couple solutions that we have. What do you think? How would you like us to move forward? I tell you, if you do that, you're up for promotions, right? You're going to be well-liked by your senior leader, and you're going to make his or her job a whole lot easier. You may question, like, how can I ever find the time to be able to do that? Like, what, 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 what does it really take to create those kinds of solutions? Why well, believe in what we call the 10x rule? The 10x rule means that every single time you go and spend moments with your senior leader, you should spend 10 times the amount of time preparing for it. So let's say you've got a one-minute meeting with your leader. Spend 10 minutes preparing for that. And what does that do? That helps you kind of create a better idea of the message you want to give to your senior leader. Helps you come up with solutions instead of just sharing problems. Helps you become more concise so you're actually not taking up some of their time. Now, you may be wondering too, well, Jason, how in the world can I find the time to do this? Great question, wonderful idea, and definitely a good challenge of senior leaders. If you want some support for this, again, I've got a whole other session on how to find time, how leaders can actually create more time in their schedule to do important things like creating solutions or spending time developing their people. I've got a free resource for you today though. So everybody listening to DPS today, thanks for being here for a free resource for you. You can go on to www.influencingforimpact, influencingforimpact.com backslash finding time, finding time. And if you go onto that website, you'll realize that there's a wonderful resource there for you that gives you a whole lot of strategies on how you can find more time in your day. So best of luck with that. That's the second way we can be able to help our senior leaders grow. The third way is to do, other, do things that other people won't do, all right? Now I throw a picture of toilets on here because why? Nobody really likes to clean up the toilets, right? Well, there's a lot of job responsibilities that you might have in your department or within your organization that some people just don't want to do at all. Maybe it's... um you know, working through some of the big data. Maybe it's cleaning some things up or reorganizing. Maybe it's just taking care of the office. Maybe, it, I don't know what it is, but what are some things that are just hard or difficult to do? Maybe it's those tough conversations to have, that client that's just a beast to work with. Whatever it is, jump in and volunteer. Decide, hey, that's going to be me. I'm going to be known as a person that jumps up in challenging, opportun in challenging times and seeks opportunity to be able to solve those challenging times. Again, it could be something simple or small where you're cleaning something up around the office or something pretty big where you're working with a very complicated and maybe demanding client. Learn how to do those things. Get good at working with difficult people. Get good at working with hard clients. Your senior leader is going to love you for that and they'll recognize you, right? They'll, they'll, this is your way that you can be able to separate yourself from the crowd is by volunteering to do those things that other people won't do. 
So ladies and gentlemen, those are the three different ideas on what we can do to lighten the load of our senior leader. Don't add weight, honor your leader's time, and do what other people won't. I'm going to give us just a second of a break here for you to kind of reflect a bit and think in your own reality, in your own job responsibilities, maybe as you're working as a machine learning scientist or you're into, you know, some of the analysis or intelligence or maybe you're a data engineer or where, whatever you might be doing. I just want you to think in your own role. What are the things that you could do to lighten your leader's load? Perhaps it's one of these three things or maybe there's something else you can do. I find it imperative for us to reflect frequently as middle-level leaders on what we can do to actually make our senior leaders' load lighter. I know, I know, they're there to serve us, they're there to help us, they're there to support us. Those are all good things, but we too should be there to help them. If we do so, it actually creates amazing degrees of influence. If they see us as not a challenge or a problem or something that adds more weight to their load, but somebody that really does help them and assist them in their job, if they see us that way, well, gosh, the degree of influence that we can develop with our senior leaders is great. We can be able to have great sway and influence over what happens in our organization through the use of our relationship with our senior leader. So think on that, reflect on that. And then as you do so, let's switch gears a little bit and start talking about the other side, not the rock, but the hard place, your employees and how we can help free your employees, knock down that wall, break down the things that are surrounding them so that they can have more autonomy in doing their jobs and more ability of being empowered by you. That's the next question, all right? So again, I've got three different strategies, three different ideas that we can be able to use in order to do that. Here's the first one. I want you to consider and think about what might it take to get these kinds of results. So there's a research study that was done about a decade ago or so, and they found that there is one thing, one thing that leaders can do that would get you all the things listed right here on the screen. Increased job performance, less burnout, decreased workload, stronger teamwork, less stress for you. All of these nine things you can get if you do just one thing. Do you know what that is? Yeah, that one thing, it happens to be delegation. If you simply learn how to delegate, then you can be able to gain all these things. Who wouldn't want these, right? Who wouldn't want this in your organization? Well, I think we all would. Now, before we move on, throw into chat here, what stops you from delegating? We all know it's important. We all know it's good. We all know there's wonderful benefits that come from delegating, but yet we don't do it very often. So the question becomes, why not? Why don't we? Go ahead and throw into chat a few of your own ideas. I've actually got several different ideas as I've worked with middle-level leaders. They're listed here. Perhaps it's a degree of insecurity. We worry that if we delegate everything, we won't have a job left. Trust me, folks, that's not going to happen. If you're that good at delegating, you're always going to have a job to come back to. Maybe we don't have very much confidence in other people that they can do their job, or maybe we don't know how to delegate. We lack the ability to do it. Perhaps we find personal enjoyment in doing certain tasks. When I was working as a principal, I had a huge budget for materials and supplies, and I love shopping on Amazon. I just do. So I would actually go on Amazon and spend our budgets and supplies funds on the things that the school needed. Now, is that the job and responsibility of the principal? Absolutely not, but I found personal enjoyment in it. So I kept a hold of it when I should have delegated it off to somebody else. Maybe it's habit. Maybe we come into work and we don't even think about the things that we could delegate or empower other people with. Perhaps it's an ability to find somebody else. My guess there is that we just haven't looked hard enough. Maybe we have passed something on to somebody else and, well, they felt miserably at it. Like it simply just didn't work. And so now we're hesitant about doing it again. Perhaps it's a lack of time. We just can't find the time for it. Or the number one reason that I've found in my life and as I've worked with leaders, is an I do a best mindset. That is, they believe, I believe, we all believe that we can do it the best, the highest quality, the most efficiency, in the shortest amount of time. I mean, we just, let's be honest, we are experts at what we do. So uh, delegating these responsibilities onto somebody else scares us because maybe they're not going to do it right. Maybe there'll be mistakes. Maybe it won't be 
accurate as we want it to be. Maybe it will take much more time. And you know what? The answer to all those questions is yes, it probably will. But that doesn't mean we don't stop. So let's figure out how we can break down this wall and learn how to free our employees. I call this sharing the plate. And what I'd encourage you to do is sometime after this session, write down all of the responsibilities, all the things that you find yourself doing. What is it that you consume your time with in work? And then, once you've got the list completed, go through and circle the things that only you can do. That is, this is something that absolutely no way in the world can you pass on to another individual. For example, if you are in the finance area of um, your department, perhaps it's only you that can sign checks because the bank has only authorized you to do so. That's something you can't delegate on, so you have to be the signer of checks. Okay, I get it. That's one thing you can't pass on. But my guess is almost everything you write down, you can pass on. Almost everything that you have are things that could be delegated to somebody else. So write all those down. Pick one and decide, I'm going to share my plate, right? My plate is so full of lots of things, I'm going to share that with the employees that I'm working with. How can we do that specifically? Well, you've probably heard of the phrase, delegate or die. I like to kind of switch that around a little bit and call it die to delegate, die to delegate. It's an acronym. It's just a simple three-step process in how we can delegate things onto our employees. D stands for describe the task. So we want to do a really good job of describing in very good detail what the task is. Let's be specific in what is required. One of my good friends is the HR director for Chobani Yogurt. You may know of this yogurt. You may, might not know of this yogurt. But in America, Chobani Yogurt is really big. In fact, it's probably the number one best-selling Greek yogurt in America. And they have an incredible culture. Their workforce are very happy to come to work every single day. They qualify for the best places to work. They have huge amounts of diversity. Over 13 languages are spoken at the plant that my friend works at alone. Um, they have their board that's made up of half women and half men. So great organization. Well, I called him up one day because I'm writing a book. And I said, hey, his name is Brandon. Hey, Brandon. If you could describe for me just one thing, what's the one thing that really creates the culture of Jibani? What's the one thing that really helps you facilitate this positive environment for all of your workers? And I thought that he might take a few minutes to kind of think about that, but he didn't. Like almost immediately he came back to me and he says, I know exactly what that is. And I'm like, you, you do? He goes, yeah, yeah, I know exactly what that is. If we're going to create a good environment, we have to be extremely clear in our directions. That is, we spend a lot of time in training people, in describing the task of what we want them to do. They are animals when it comes to SOPs, so standardized operating procedures. They've created an SOP for almost every single process. They've put these SOPs into pictures, so basically anybody's able to follow them as you look through pictures, no matter the language barriers that exist. And why, why is that important? Because then people know what their job is. In fact, I believe, ladies and gentlemen, every employee comes to work with basically three questions on their mind. Where are we going? That's where's your vision? What are we trying to accomplish? How are we going to get there? So what are the steps that we're going to take as an organization to meet that vision? And what is my role? What is my role? So they're wondering. They want to know, right? Please describe in minute detail what it is that you want me to do. That's the D on describe the task. I stands for including a timeline. Sometimes we might delegate a responsibility off to somebody. But we're kind of fuzzy on the timeline. Or we might even say something like ASAP. Well, ASAP to me might mean the next hour. To somebody else, it could be by the end of the day. To somebody else, it could be by the end of the week. So we're just not very good at really describing and helping people understand timelines when it comes to our delegated work. So be very meticulous in making sure that you're clear about when you want the work done. It might be maybe a report that you're passing on to somebody. Hey, Frank, I'm asking you to do this report. It needs to be done by the 30th of the month, every single month. And so please get this done by the 30th of the month. The first one will be due the 30th of this month. Right? Now we know. We've got a timeline. Maybe you uh, are doing some data integration. 
and uh, you're passing some of these, you know, this, this project on to somebody, and it's for a particular client that you're working with. Well, great. This is this is wonderful. You're delegating, but if you don't give them a timeline, they might not know the urgency that you have. So this is a demanding client, and they need stuff done right now. You might turn to the individual and and just simply say, "Hey, Sirim, we're asking you to get this completed by." You know, next Tuesday, I know it's a big job and there's a lot of tasks that are required in this, but we, we do need this work done by next Tuesday, by the end of the day, by the way. When I say Tuesday, sometimes that can be confusing people in the morning, in the afternoon, the night, uh, previously to that, uh, who knows? No, nope, you should say Tuesday at three o'clock. This is when we need this done. Makes the picture just clear for people, helps them understand the urgency that's behind that. E stands for explain the quality or end result. Now, out of all the things that you do, this might be the most important thing. You want to let them know exactly what it should look like when they're finished. When I was teaching students as a social studies teacher, we had a big bookshelf with all kinds of books on it that students could be able to kind of grab and read and learn from. Well, I found one day that they're not putting their books back very well at all. So I actually took a picture of how the bookshelf should look and posted that picture right on the bookshelf and told my students, ladies and gentlemen, when you check out a book or you go over here to the bookshelf to read, this is the way the bookshelf should look by the end of the period. And because I was really clear on explaining the end result of what this will look like, my students complied. They did a pretty good job of doing that. The same thing can work with your direct reports. As you're working with them, you can explain to them, all right, you know, this is the end result. This is the clarity that we need to get by the end when you're finished with this project. I say this is really important because they might have a different way of going about it than you. You've been doing it for years and years and years, maybe even decades the same way, and it works pretty well. But perhaps there's a different way that it could be done. And your direct report might go about it that different way. In fact, they might even find a more efficient way to get it done and they can have the freedom to do so if you just explain to them what the end result is and then give them the give them the ability to choose how they get there. So describe the task, include a timeline, explain the quality and the end results. This is die to delegate, which is one way that we can be able to share our plate and delegate to other people. It's a way to break down that wall and free our employees. A second way, oh, before I move on, I forgot, this is a fantastic quote. The authors uh, who wrote a book called Unleashed, Free and More, said, when people are trained and trusted to lead in their own spheres of influence, they find out they can do things they never imagined were possible. They're simply waiting for permission. Think on that, folks, for just a little bit. The people you're working with are waiting for permission to do more. And you're in a perfect opportunity to grant that permission. The second thing we can do to be able to free our employees is to keep the monkey on their back. <laughs> so we might delegate a responsibility off to somebody, but what's interesting is our humans are inherently lazy. They just don't like doing a whole lot of work. And so once you kind of take this responsibility, we'll call it a monkey, off of your back and you pass it onto the back of somebody else, well, they're gonna look for lots of different ways to get out of that responsibility. Why? Because they're humans. That's just what we do. We like to take the easiest route, the pathway of least resistance. Let me tell you a story. I was working with a cheese manufacturing plant. And in this plant, there was a supervisor named Victor and a frontline employee named Eric. And Victor and Eric were working one day when the plant was shut down. It shuts down once per year so they can go through and do preventative maintenance and cleanup and all those kinds of things that are good for factories to do. Well, during this particular day, Victor went over to Eric and told Eric, Eric, here's the deal. During the, your shift today, I want you to replace all the gaskets at the end of the piping right before it goes into the cheese machines. So there's piping that goes with the liquid cheese, and then there's you know a, a, a nut and, some, and a gasket that fits within that that needs to be replaced every year. It's preventative maintenance. And so Eric knew how to do this. He nodded his head and said, sure, I can do that. Well, about 15 minutes later, Eric came back to Victor and he said, Victor, I've got a problem. He says, well, what is that, Eric? Well, I've been looking around for the specialized wrench that I need to get the you know nuts off the end of this piping, and I can't find it anywhere. Well, being a good leader, Victor said, oh, I think I know where that is. Give me a few minutes, I'll go find it. You see, most times, new leaders or even experienced leaders believe that it is their job 
to solve all the problems and to have all the answers. And this is exactly how Victor thought. So Victor starts walking off and going and trying to find this wrench. But before he could actually look for it, he gets interrupted by another employee. And then another employee and another employee. Three hours later, Victor has the thought, oh my gosh, I forgot to find that wrench. And therefore goes and tries to find the wrench. He found, he finds it actually in the second place that he thought it would be at and comes back to find Eric only to realize that Eric's shift has just ended. So Victor decides, well, I have to do this myself now. He goes around and replaces all the different gaskets. He misses dinner with his family and thinks to himself, this delegation stuff just doesn't work. What do you think that Eric was doing during this time? <laughs> he was probably having a pretty good day, you know, being a little lazy and not having much responsibility to do, while Victor took on this huge burden of getting everything done. The problem here was, is that they didn't keep the monkey on their back. Victor took this monkey away from Eric and removed his responsibility and brought the responsibility onto him. That's not a good way to do it. So I've got for us a couple of different strategies on how we can move through that. One is, instead of just taking on that responsibility, Victor could have turned back to Eric and say something like, Eric, you know, I believe that it could be in three different locations. I think it could be where it's supposed to be, in the toolbox. I think that it could be over on the shred cheese line because I saw them using it yesterday. They had a maintenance issue over there. Or there's a red toolbox way back in the warehouse room. Sometimes it ends up there. Perhaps you can go over and look in those different locations. And when you find it, come tell me that you found it, okay? So what is he doing? He's providing options. One of the most beautiful things we can do as middle-level leaders is to stop solving all the problems. It's not your job to solve the problems. Your job is to help people solve their own problems. And the first step of doing that is to provide some options. Give them some thoughts of what you might do, but don't do the work yourself. Let them do the work. Another strategy you can use is to reverse the question. Perhaps you believe they should already know what to do. They don't need your guidance. They just need you to get them to think a little deeper, to take responsibility for completing the action. So they might come to you with the problem and then you just simply turn it around and say, hmm, that's an interesting question. What do you think we should do about this? <laughs> I had this issue with a staff member one time that was actually working on her principal's license. So she wanted to be a principal of a school and she came to me with a problem about a student. So I turned to her and I said, well, take off your teacher hat and put on your administrative hat. What do you think you would do if you were in this situation? Oh, Jason, I just can't do that. I'm just too emotionally upset about the situation that's going on. I said, no, 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 no. Emotions or not, you still need to figure this out. Well, I just can't. I just need you to solve this problem. I needed to tell me what to do. And I actually refused to take that monkey back. I wanted to keep it on her back. So I turned the question around and said, actually, no, I, I'm very curious in what you would like to do. It looks like you need some time to think about it. So I know that you've got a preparation period in a couple of hours. I'll come visit your classroom in a couple of hours. And hopefully you'll have an idea or two of what you can do about the situation. You see, ladies and gentlemen, we carry this heavy burden and we don't have to. We can easily turn this right back around to our staff members, our direct reports, by providing options or reversing the question. It's honestly their responsibility. And clearly, when they get this done, when they solve their own problems, they feel better about themselves. They're more empowered. They are forced to think and come up with new ideas, which makes them actually better employees. Now, if you've mastered both these sides, you've got this place where your employees are coming to you and you're reversing questions, they're answering well, they don't need a whole lot of options for you, maybe it's time for step three. And step three is teach them this phrase called, I intend to. That is when somebody comes to you with a problem, maybe they just state the problem and then state how they're going to solve it. Very similar to what you could do to your senior leader, right? Hey, uh, we were doing this you know, work for a particular client. It seems like we're stuck in this particular area. Here's the problem that we have, and here's what I intend to do to solve the problem. May I move forward with that? It's as simple as that. So they're coming to you with problems and solutions, 
And your job simply is to put a check mark on their solution to tell them, hey, yeah, you know what, that's a great idea. Or, oh, you know, have you considered this or thought about that? Or, no, 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 don't do that, please, don't do that, right? Gives you some opportunity to give some feedback to them while still empowering them to do their work. So three different strategies we can use to keep the monkey on the back of our employees. Provide options, reverse the question, and teach I intend to. If you are committed to empowering your employees by keeping the monkey on their back, throw into chat, say, I'm committed, right? You want to get this done. You want to help them think more. Now, as I've worked with middle-level leaders, delegation is a little bit difficult, but people pick up onto it. Teaching them to keep the monkey on their back, they love. In fact, they pick up on that pretty quickly. But the struggle they have really comes down to trusting their employees to get the work done right the first time. And I find that a problem because did you get the work done right the first time? Probably not. So our third step of breaking down that wall of freeing our employees is actually making it safe to fail. It's encouraging failure in organizations. I know that sounds wrong. I know we're trying to avoid failure as much as possible, but it's actually through failure that we grow. And when you grow your employees, your organization grows. You grow in your leadership. It's the best way. It's the um, most beneficial asset you can invest your time into, and that's your employees. There was a study done one time. It was actually an experiment of pottery. They went to a pottery teacher uh, and found two different classes. And they said, here's the deal. With one class, we, we'd like you to explain that their grade is going to be based upon the quality of the pots that they throw. So they make pots in these pottery classes and, and, and their grade is going to be based on the, on the quality. So really high quality, great design, strong structured kind of pots will receive A grades and weak ones won't pass the class at all. Then they said, for another class, we'd like you to introduce the idea that it's not really the quality that matters. Obviously, it's important to do good quality products, but that's not what you're going to be graded on. You're going to be graded on the number of pots that you can actually produce, the number of pots that you throw. So that class was challenged to just make as many pots as possible, as fast as possible, and, and, and then that's where their grade is going to come. So people that were able to create lots of pots would get an A, and those that couldn't produce very many pots at all would not pass a class. Well, the entire semester went on, and it was time to do the final grades at the end of, this, end of the semester. I'm curious, what do you think? Which class produced higher quality pots? Interestingly, it's the class that was challenged to make as many pots as possible. Those that took inordinate amount of times to make sure everything's perfect lost out on learning from mistakes because a lot of their pots got into the kiln where they fire it with great heat and make it from a soft clay into a hard stone-like substance. And a lot of times it would, there would break or fracture or explode or you know, there would be problems in the firing process because it takes some experience and some practice to get used to how clay responds inside of a kiln. Contrast that with the other class that just made tons of them and they learned very quickly all the things that are important to do when you're formulating a bowl so that it doesn't explode inside of the kiln. And at the end of the day, they made higher quality and a greater degree, a greater number of pots than the first class. What does this teach us? Ladies and gentlemen, this teaches us that we can learn from our failure. Failure is actually good for our organizations. We want to be able to encourage this. I want you to consider companies that decided not to encourage failure. Uh, Kodak, for example, is a company. Nobody really even pays attention to Kodak anymore. It used to be a huge company, one of the best film companies with a huge market share of what was going on. They don't have any of that anymore. It's non-existent. Why? Because they were too scared to get in the digital market. They actually created digital photography. Kodak created the rights. They discovered how to do things digitally but they were scared of giving up and failing on their print film. So they didn't move forward. Um, you know, you look at Nokia, for example. Nokia had a fantastic market share over cell phones. And then we see these digital things coming into place and they get scared. They decide not to make decisions that might cause failure. 
and therefore they're almost non-existent now. We can do the same thing with Netflix and Yahoo and you know there's a whole lot of other companies that simply made it very unsafe to fell. People felt like they wanted they needed to do perfection or they couldn't do anything at all. And therefore these companies didn't take the risks that they needed to take in order to really grow and to outperform their competition. Therefore they got swallowed up by their competition because the other side made it safe to fell. So what can we do about this? How can we be able to make it safe to fell? I think there's some ways we can use use it just to celebrate. Um, a failure board, for example. You know, find a big whiteboard in your office and write up failures that are going on and have this as a learning opportunity, a place where your employees can teach other employees about mistakes that they've made and what not to do next time. It's called a failure board. A failure resume. <laughs> we all have created a CV or some kind of resume that kind of highlights the best things about who we are and what we do, and that's great and fine and it makes us feel good. But what about creating a failure resume? How powerful would it be for you as a leader to go to your staff and say, look, here's the 13 ways that I've really screwed up over the course of my career. And that just makes it safer for people to realize, you know what, failure is actually something that is okay. How many times did a baby, does a baby have to fall down in their experience of trying to learn how to walk? And yet, what do we do? Every time they fall, we we highlight it, right? Oh, you fell again, but yay, good job. You did a little bit. All right, get back up. You know, we just encourage, 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 even though the failure happened. Same thing can happen with a failure board or failure resume, or we're starting with failure. Perhaps in your next meeting, you get together and in, instead of jumping right into the agenda, you start off by saying, you know what, we're going to go around the room today and I'd like each of you to share one failure that has occurred over the last couple weeks in your work just opens it up and creates that psychological safety within your team so that it is okay to fail, which also means it's okay to take risks, which also means that your company's gonna grow and they're gonna grow and you're gonna grow and your senior leader will grow and good things will happen when we do so. Finally, we could do a FOLO celebration. FOLO stands for Failure Opens Learning Opportunities. Again, Failure Opens Learning Opportunities. These are places where we can celebrate failures that do occur. I think on this for just a minute, um, you probably know bubble wrap. Bubble wrap is a stuff that people use to ship um, things that are fragile or breakable uh, in, in cardboard boxes or other kinds of containers. Well, once upon a time, that was actually created to be a wallpaper, right? To go up on your walls is just kind of a creative new kind of design. Well, obviously, it was a huge failure, but they celebrated and said, you know what, How, uh, what, what can we do? How can we be able to use this? They happened to find IBM, which was a computer company that was shipping computers across the world at the time. They needed something safe to ship their computers in, and bubble wrap happened to be it. So a huge celebration came from that. When somebody fails in your team, how do you respond to that? Let me just kind of share this experience. I have two friends. Uh, they're both partners in a business. They're in their 70s now, so they've been around for a long time. One's name is Paul, and the other one is Michael. And Paul and Michael had very different experiences when it comes to failure. You see, when Michael was growing up, he had an alcoholic father. And one day when Michael was in elementary school, he came home from school and his father was just drunk, right? He was full of alcohol. But in his alcoholic stupor, he decided to start rewiring the electrical circuit box. So he's got the electrical box, he's got all the power turned off, and he needs somebody to hold a flashlight. So he asks Michael to hold this flashlight as he's rewiring this electrical circuit box. Well, Michael's in elementary school, right? He's distracted. He's moving that flashlight all around the place and, and his dad gets really mad at him, starts to yell at him and curse at him. And eventually Michael drops the flashlight and that was a very terrible, miserable, hurtful experience for Michael. In fact, he had lots of those experiences. Anytime Michael screwed up, his dad really, really got after him. And he learned that failure hurts and that you need to avoid failure as long as possible. And he lived in that life for like 30 years until he met Paul. And Paul had a different experience to help change Michael's mind. You see, when Paul was growing up, about the same time, his parents decided to have a movie night on a Friday night. Now, back in that day, you had to get a pot and put some oil in it, get the oil hot, and then you had kernels to put in to be able to make popcorn for movie night. So Paul went to the kitchen and he got the pot hot and put some oil in it and he grabbed the bag of kernels and brought it across and the hot pan singed the bag, made a hole, and all these kernels go spreading out everywhere. Well, Paul's parents come rushing in and they ask two questions. Paul, are you okay? And Paul, how can we help you clean up this mess? 
You see, Paul learned something that day too. Paul learned heat melts plastic. That's what he learned. He also learned it's okay to mess up. It's okay to fail. So I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, what's your response when somebody fails on your team? Are you making it safe to fail? Are you encouraging risk? Letting people have the psychological safety to try new things on your teams? Or are you responding like Michael's dad and being harsh and firm when any, anytime, any fail, anytime any failures happen? I tell you, if you create a safe environment where failure is okay, your teams will thrive. They will flourish and they'll stick around. They'll feel like they are valuable contributors to your organization. So when we talk about breaking down this wall, removing the hard place for you as a middle-level leader, there's three tools that I've shared today. That is share your plate, keep the monkey on their back, and make it safe to fail. By doing these things, you can start to break down that wall and make life a little bit easier for the people that you lead and easier for you, by the way. So in short, as a middle-level leader, you've got a lot of challenges that you're facing. You have are kind of like stuck between a rock and a hard place. The rock is your senior leader lifting a heavy burden. Your job is to help support that burden, help lighten that load. Your employees are actually behind a wall. That's the hard place. Your job is to break down that wall, help empower and delegate and get them learning and taking risks and growing in their own sphere. And I encourage you to do these things because when you do, your senior leader is going to like you more and your direct reports would do more for you. Therefore, making you like your job better, having less anxiety, less burnout, less stress, and more joy and happiness coming from your job. That's what we get when we lighten the load and free our employees. I'd like to thank, uh, obviously, Microsoft for helping us out, the Data Platform Geeks, the DPG, DPS, and, and uh, all, all of the great contributors to this. Thank you for allowing me to have the opportunity to be able to speak with you today. If you'd like to stay in contact, there's a QR code right there. That'll lead you over to my uh, uh, newsletter, and you can sign up. I've got a newsletter that I send off a couple of times per month with just little tidbits about how to lead and making your job easier. Or you can find my website and email address there. Feel free to reach out and contact me anytime you'd like if you've got questions or comments in regards to middle-level leadership. That is my specialty. I like to just make it easier for people to lead from the middle. Thank you again for your time. This is Jason Hunt, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the DPS conference. Have a great day.